Since I don't want to ghost the internet for the next few months, I thought it would be nice to put out a lower effort video rather than disappearing from the channel for another two years. Ah, whoops. For these past few months, I've been reading theory and watching some documentaries to really educate myself, so I thought it'd be a nice change of pace to recommend some I've been watching lately. Others have already done book recommendation videos, so if you prefer reading, feel free to check them out. However, I always find documentaries to be a nice way to ground my theoretical understanding with reality. All the documentaries I'll recommend will be freely available on YouTube or another platform and link in the description. With that out of the way, let's get started. This first recommendation is more of a general one. Pearl Cult makes honestly some of the most incisive documentaries of our time. Not only are they informative, they are long and go in-depth on a subject matter. If you are a Marxist, these documentaries are a must-watch. I would first recommend watching History is Marching and the behemoth of documentary that is A Dying Culture. Pretty much anything that Pearl Cult makes is a mandatory watch, and it's a shame they don't have more views. Personally, I watched History's Marching right after reading Lenin's Imperialism, and it did a great job updating and orienting that text to the modern political and economic climate. Although Pearl Cult films aren't necessarily the most riveting, as they tend to rely on stock footage, the dense amount of information they provide more than makes up for it. Pearl Cult documentaries tend to cover very different topics, but they all have the same thread of urgency. In History's Marching, the filmmakers argue that what is coming is not a second Cold War, but possibly a third imperialist world war. They look at evidence such as straining relationships between imperialist blocs to support their claim, and in my opinion, it is a scarily convincing argument. With the threat of a new imperialist war on the horizon as well as climate change, Pearl Cult emphasizes that we are now stuck between two choices, socialism or extinction. It is clear to see that US imperialism is pursuing a strategy of aggressive competition and confrontation against Russia and China. However, sober analysis reveals that a further confrontation that between the US and Europe is today a reality of imperialist society. The centrality given to this conflict in this film is intended to demonstrate the depth of the crisis facing this society. That this alliance, which has subsisted since 1945, is today falling into ruin is a clear indication that the imperialist crisis is forcing a third redivision of the world between great powers. The conditions for world war are clearly forming. Whilst it is uncertain how long it may take these contradictions to flourish, or how the alliances of such a war may fall, its fundamental basis is today undeniable. This is another must-watch documentary for any radicals out there. The Revolution Will Not Be Televised concerns the 2002 attempted coup in Venezuela against Hugo Chavez, with a twist. The crew for this documentary was originally filming a biographical look at Chavez, but were suddenly caught up in this historical moment. As a result, the crew was able to be on the inside while the coup was taking place, and was even able to film the action while it was going on. Very rarely do we get to be on the inside of a reactionary coup, and the film does not hesitate to show the inner workings of such conspiracies. It depicts how such coups operate, contacting the United States government, manipulating the private media, and their utilization of indiscriminate violence. The dissection of reactionary coups alone makes this film an essential watch. However, the film not only provides a unique view on the event, but is a brilliant and moving piece by itself. I was not bored once while watching this film. As radicals, we read and understand the brutality and horrors of American imperialism, but seeing the blood on innocent people's faces protesters being shot at, and people crying as their democratic government is overthrown grants an understanding of imperialism that is not easily obtained, living in the imperial core. Chavez had not been seen or heard of since he'd been taken away two days earlier. That morning as we drove around Caracas, the atmosphere was electric. Despite police repression, people had decided to march on the palace. Pride Denied, Homo Nationalism and the Future of Queer Politics was a great introduction to some concepts I previously hadn't understood or even known about, such as homo nationalism and pinkwashing, connecting queer identity with the struggle of radical politics. The film also doesn't shy away from analyzing how mainstream gay rights often only benefits a few wealthy gays at the top. Beyond that, the documentary delves into the relationship between gay rights and imperialism, settler colonialism, and national oppression, and how gays are often touted to show how modern Western nations are in comparison to the, implied inherently, homophobic backwards countries of the third world. It isn't a 
contrary to voice legitimate critiques of settler states such as Israel and vehemently protests the use of gay rights to advance its apartheid agenda. The documentary also goes into the radical origins of Pride, namely the Stonewall and Bathhouse riots, and how these movements for freedom and liberation have been co-opted by corporate sponsors that control the expression of those on the ground. It is honestly a shame that this film doesn't have more attention, and if you are a queer radical or even a radical in general, this film is definitely a must watch. Part of why pinkwashing is so important for us to think about is because we're living in a moment in which major institutions and governments are using the narratives of our freedom struggles and our you know different social movements to repackage themselves and to actually expand their terrifying work. And so we all need to become more able to read propaganda and to kind of understand how that works. And so um, having people learn about like Brand Israel and like the way pinkwashing works is a way of having people think about how propaganda works generally and how this kind of rebranding is working and how things like racism and colonialism operate today. They operate by telling you that they are including your community and that they're sites of recognition and inclusion rather than operating through often the models people think of like explicit segregation in a space is the way people think of like that's what racism looks like. Actually racism can look like these narratives of like multicultural queer inclusion. This is another film in the same vein as The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, this time focusing on the 1992 American invasion of Panama. The big difference here, of course, is that the Americans were successful in their overthrow. I hadn't actually heard of this film until Michael Parenti mentioned it in a lecture. He talks about how despite the fact it won an Oscar for Best Documentary, it was mostly suppressed within the United States, barely being shown on television. Too, because, because I was in it, I was one of the talking heads. That was Panama Deception. I, I was in a film that won an Academy Award. I should have held out for a bigger fee, Peter, I think. I have to think about it, I keep that in mind. Um, Panama Deception did play on KQED one night, maybe twice, uh, and, and in Boston once, and one or two other PBS outlets. That's all. Over the whole country, of all of them, they, they wouldn't This is after it won an Academy Award, too. So, so even where supposedly we are, um, you know, right at the top of it, it's not so true. The documentary itself shows the same pattern of American imperialism we saw in Venezuela during the 2002 coup attempt. It exposes media manipulation, mass graves, and burnt down neighborhoods, as well as the empty reasons given by the American government for such an invasion. Our country has been ruined, our homes have been destroyed, and we still have no real answers. So what's left but to take to the streets? Since we didn't lose our lives in the war, we're willing to risk them fighting for our rights. George Bush, may his children be spared with my daughter is being subjected to. My daughter who doesn't want to live, may his generation be spared what our generation is living through. He should ask God for forgiveness for all the damage caused to many families down here. Salud is a great film that exposes how oppressive and miserable a lack of health care is for disconnected rural communities and impoverished nations. The documentary goes in-depth on how Cuba is spearheading the movement for free entitlement to health care. By rejecting the private health care model, Cuba has managed to build one of the world's most sophisticated public health care systems from scratch. This documentary shows how various countries such as South Africa, the Gambia, Venezuela, and Honduras have been able to ask for aid from Cuban doctors to assist their own impoverished rural communities. This international solidarity would not be possible under capitalism, which sees medicine as a commodity and patients as customers. The new system of Cuban medicine understands that to treat an ill patient, one must immerse themselves in the community and treat the community as a whole. This documentary does a great job breaking down how the Cuban system is different from the capital system, incentivizing doctors not with money, but by training them in their own communities and allowing them them to help their neighbors. As radicals, we often lose sight of the world we want, but this documentary provides a hopeful look towards the future we should all strive to build, especially in times of a pandemic. Eso sí es verdad que es nuevo en Venezuela, que es educar a la población en medicina, educando médicos de altísima calidad en las comunidades. Nosotros necesitamos miles de médicos y lo vamos a crear con quién? Con los médicos cubanos. Son 20 mil dedicados a eso. ¿Cómo te sientes, mi amor? El concepto de la universidad cambia, puesto que ahora la Facultad de Medicina se sale de su pequeño castillo o torre de marfil y se va a las comunidades donde están los médicos trabajando. Allí el médico barrio adentro es el tutor directo de ese estudiante. These next three documentaries will cover the DPRK, and I recommend that they be watched in the order I put them. 
This first documentary is in the style of a YouTube video and is very watchable to any newcomer who still believes everything they hear about the DPRK. I remember watching this video on YouTube when it first came out three years ago. It completely changed my mind about the DPRK and the common sense myths I had heard. All these years later and it still holds up. The fake news story about Kim Jong-un's death recently suddenly being awkwardly revealed that actually he was alive the whole time and that the US media was making it all up reveals the longevity of anti-DPRK sentiment. The perpetual and constant anti-DPRK propaganda we in the West are bombarded with makes this documentary an essential watch. This documentary specifically tackles the myth that everyone in the DPRK is essentially forced to have a Kim Jong-un haircut, with filmmakers themselves comedically traveling there to show that it was all nonsense. Although I found some of the arguments more or less compelling than others, this should be a mandatory watch for anyone trying to learn about the DPRK. Demarcating between fact and fiction in an increasingly propagandized media is difficult, but this documentary certainly provides an interesting roadmap and starting point for anyone willing to make that journey. North Korea, the most dangerous country in the world. Infamous for its bizarre and brutal regime, run by a crazy dictator who won't let anyone in or out. But these guys, they just want a haircut. <laughs> This next documentary is the perfect response to, but what about the defectors when discussing the DPRK? It shows how South, <coughs> fake, Korea systematically de facto kidnaps unsuspecting DPRK citizens, holds them in prison for weeks up to six months, and forces them to stay in the country even when they wish to return home. Those who do not cooperate are made out to be enemy spies to stir up anti-DPRK sentiment, while those who are left are bribed into making over-exaggerated testimony to stir the hearts of ignorant Westerners against the North Korean regime. What's left for the kidnapped DPRK citizens and defectors that refuse to sell fake stories? Nothing. They are monitored by the NIS, the South Korean police agency, and forced to live a life they cannot bear, separated from their family, their country, and the truth. The moving story of Kim, who attempted suicide two times after being unable to return to her family in the DPRK, is unbearably tragic. The violence imposed on the DPRK by Western powers is clearer in that moment than it has ever been, and the people suffering are innocents who only want to live peaceful lives. 좋아요. 그때 저는 참 막막하고 하늘이 무너졌고 아이 지구상에 세상에 이런 게 존재할 수 있구나 해외에 있는 자기 나라 국민이 아닌 해외에 있는 사람을 남의 나라 남의 사람을 이렇게 유인해서 납치해다가는 덕방에 가두고 강제로 소약서를 받아내고 강제로 자기 나라 국적을 지워주고는 나중에라도 부르 자기 고향 가져간 데 도망갈까 봐. 이 7년 세월을 요건을 안 해주는 이런 세상이 정말 존재하는구나 이게 너무 슬프고 힘들고 아 이거 사람 사는 세상인데 이 사람들도 인간이고 가족이 있는데 나를 바라보면서 미안하지 않을까 어떻게 하루아침에 엄마한테서 딸을 빼앗고 딸에게서 엄마의 사랑을 빼앗는 이런 천체도 하지 못할 잔인한 짓을 하면서도 정말 미안하지 않을까 to end off this DPRK trilogy, we have this two hour long behemoth of a documentary. A common criticism against the previous documentary is that it only interviews three people and therefore might not be representative of the common view. However, this nearly two hour long film completely dismantles that argument by showing daily life in the DPRK toured by a South Korean woman who happened to be able to visit the country. I'll be honest, this film is boring. It is a monotonous and tedious documentary of ordinary life in the DPRK. Yet somehow, in the stories of everyday life, a fascinating truth is revealed. The people of the DPRK live boring, ordinary lives just like everyone else. The monotony of life in the DPRK shatters the illusion and propaganda that it is some totalitarian communist nightmare where everyone is brainwashed. In fact, from the little tidbits of the film, it seems that the people there are more aware of their situation than outsiders. They recognize that they must support their country or else the imperialists will destroy them as they have done with countless other socialist nations. They understand with startling accuracy their own situation and behave rationally. Although it may seem odd to outsiders, the imperialist barrage against the DPRK and its people explains their actions, and it only takes a a little bit of time to listen and understand their perspective. 북의 젊은 세대들은 동일을 생각을 합니까? 주혁 씨 같은 경우도 개인적으로. 네, 그 우리 지금 어, 인민 경제도 그렇고 해서 유럽 부문에 이거 어, 이제 통일이 되면 통 통일이 되면 더잘살수 있는 그런 어, 전망도 있고 그러면 어, 제일 
처보적으로는 우리 시영님께서 장관님께서 이거 조국 통일 문제를 세게 관심하셨는데 이 문제 우리 대해서 해결을 못 하게 되면 그러면 시영님 주인 장관님 주인 교수의 관찰을 못 하는 걸로 된다는 말입니다. 이게 제일 우선 가슴이 아프기 때문에 우리가 그걸 생각하고 그러면 어 이렇게 북한함이 통일된 후에 뭐 여러 가지 문제가 많이 돼가지고 뭐 되는데 어 전체 인민 대중이 이렇게 어 하나로 이렇게 마음이 다 지향하고 이렇게 결합되게 되면 그거는 뭐 그거는 힘들지 않다고 내 생각한다 말은 무슨 핏줄이 같고 언어가 같고 살색과 이거 다 풍습도 같은데 뭐 자연히 우리 우리는 한결이기 때문에 이제 어 통일만 되게 되면. 서로 무슨 대항한 데서 뭐 이런 데서 뭐 오지각거나 뭐 이런 이런 게 없을 것 같은 자연히 난 오히려 어 우리 여기서 우리 아파트에서 저저 저 옆에 아파트 만나는 사람보다 더 반가울 것 같습니다. <웃음> a basic introduction to the Black Panthers that does a fine job by itself. Keep in mind that this has been criticized by some former Black Panthers, but if you know absolutely nothing about them, I still think that this documentary is a good place to start. Black Panthers Vanguard of the Revolution depicts the rise of the Panthers, their breakfast programs, their operations, their scandals, but most of all, their downfall. Modern radicals need to learn from the Black Panthers and how they were essentially destroyed from the inside. Their work was self-defense, feeding children, and providing for their community. Yet somehow this was the organization deemed by the FBI to be one of the greatest threats to America. Cointail Pro as well as numerous plants intensified inter-party factions until outright gunfights broke out and the party essentially fell apart. I firmly believe that the Black Panthers were the closest the United States ever came to a revolutionary vanguard party, and all communists should study and take note of their shortcomings and successes. The news got to everyone in the black community who had a television, everyone who had a radio. It was in every newspaper across the nation. It put us on center stage. I don't think that loaded guns is the way to solve a problem that should be solved between people of goodwill. And anyone who would approve of this kind of demonstration must be out of their mind. I heard about Sacramento, I was like, damn, these brothers are bad. They're here up in Sacramento in the capital, packing. The boldness, the courageousness about it, the arrogance of it, that put a whole new face on things. I said, man, I want to be a part of this, whatever that is. Another documentary about a black radical, this time the revolutionary Fred Hampton. The first half of this documentary is honestly a bit hard to understand as the audio quality is not the best, however it's the second half that makes the documentary essential to watch. While shooting the film, Hampton was brutally assassinated by the government, and the filmmakers document each of the lies and contradictions told by government officials. I want to emphasize that we Marxists should study history not just because it's fun to learn, but to contextualize our actual practice and inform our work. In that same vein, this documentary provides many lessons that contextualize the modern day. Especially as the blatant murder of black people in the streets of the United States continues, we need to be educated and understand how this racist systematic violence operates. With protests continuing throughout the United States, we must never forget the lessons of the revolutionaries who came before us. The lesson of Fred Hampton's murder should be clear. Don't listen to the media about radical movements, don't trust cops, pay attention to how the legal system allows the police to get off scot-free, and listen to the people. The officers testified that the Panthers fired into that door from inside their bedroom. In fact, the door in the photo was the bedroom door, and the holes in the door were made by police gunfire at the Panthers. As you can see, bathroom door is intact. Not only the bathroom door, but the entire wall area is intact. There was a, there was a picture of the um, inside of the door to the bathroom, yes. That door, our reporters discovered, corresponded to one on the front living room adjoining the bedroom. <clears throat> there were holes in the door, when the door was open, they, those holes corresponded to holes that were in the wall adjoining between the bedroom and the living room. And when they stuck a stick through the holes, they all matched up. I have, I make, as I say again, I make no evaluation of the pictures other than to say they, they portray conditions as they existed in that apartment at the time those pictures were taken. 
Another documentary about queer issues, this time about the riots at Compton's cafeteria. It was definitely a breath of fresh air to finally have a historical documentary that emphasizes and centers trans issues, especially as many other queer documentaries sideline or alternatively place trans people on a mythical pedestal. This film avoids both pitfalls and provides a snapshot of a moment of queer history that is often sadly overlooked. The riots at Compton's cafeteria actually came before the Stonewall riots and relatively few people know about it. Although the film seems to emphasize a reformist look on political change and only briefly looks at the riot itself, the background and information provided about police brutality, sex work, and the emerging medical knowledge surrounding transsexuality was fascinating enough by itself. The document that launched my research in the first place said the fighting started when a policeman grabbed one of the queens and she threw her coffee in his face. Someone had thrown coffee in his face and there was tables turned over. Compton's erupted. People started throwing everything they could get their hands on at the police. All of the sugar shakers went through the windows and the glass doors. I think I put a sugar shaker through one of those windows. The hustlers kicked the police and punched them, and the drag queens beat them with their heavy purses. The cops retreated outside to call for backup, but cafeteria customers, maybe 60 in all, poured into the streets through the broken doors and windows and kept fighting as the paddy wagons pulled up. And that's basically it for my documentary recommendations. You'll find a link to each one in the description along with my playlist of other great documentaries. I wasn't able to talk about every documentary I wanted as this video was getting long enough already, but if you want my thoughts on other documentaries and films I've been watching, feel free to check out my Letterbox account. I write reviews for most everything I watch on there, and a lot of this video was taken from my reviews. Finally, as always, no war, but the class war. <laughs>